Amin wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yumiddin thumma amma ba'd a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim qul nahbitu minha jami'a fa imma ya'tiyannakum minni hudan fa man tabi'a hudaya fala khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun rabbi shahri sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqtatan bil lisani yafqahu qawli The phrase I left off talking about was fala khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun First, there's a fa in the ayah, which means that if someone follows the guidance that I have sent, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ Whoever followed my guidance, then there will be no fear and no grief. The other thing that I didn't mention, I failed to mention about this ayah is Allah didn't say فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيكُمْ مِنِّي He said يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي There's a noon shadda you hear there. It changes the meaning a little bit. He's putting the condition that if and only if the guidance definitely has come from me, in other words, make sure that the guidance you are following is from me. It's not from anyone else. And in the language embedded is the implication, the possibility that there will be people who think they are following guidance, but they haven't actually verified and made sure, convinced themselves that they're following the guidance of Allah. So they're actually in misguidance. So when someone does claim to give you guidance on my behalf, when, you, when something is claimed to be guidance of mine, investigate it, don't just you know, believe it with closed eyes. And this is something that is unique about our deen. Allah Azza wa Jal asks us, asks the kuffar to bring their evidences against the Qur'an. You know, the, the, the Christian or the Jew or other people of other faiths, they will legitimize their belief by saying, look, this is just my tradition. I belong to a Muslim tradition, I, or, or I belong to a Christian tradition, or a Jewish tradition, or a Hindu tradition, or a Buddhist tradition. That's who I am. And that's the, that's the culture I follow. I don't have to question it. That's just, you know, the way things are. They don't really look back and question it. But the Muslims are actually, this is one matter in which we're supposed to have so much proof that we actually challenge others to criticize our belief. That's one way of looking at it. The other thing is, when we do find people of other faiths challenging Islam, and making criticisms of Islam, we shouldn't be offended. Actually, we should welcome their challenges. You know why? Because they're doing what Allah challenged them to do anyway. <laughs> the, Allah Azza wa opened the door to that attack. He said, bring, bring forward your criticisms, your evidences. Right? That, that's the nature of our religion. It's, you know, in modern, uh, the, the modern person, the, the, the modernized rather person, postmodern person, thinks of himself as intellectual and thinks that religion is something that people accept when they don't think about things. They shut their mind off and that's when they accept religion. Like you know the modern philosophical term, the opiate of the masses. Right, it's, it's like a drug, it's a high. You don't want to accept reality, so you believe in these you know, superfluous, these fantastic things like angels and paradise and hell. That just means you can't deal with reality on the ground. This is what the atheist or the agnost will tell you, right? But Islam on the other hand, our religion, the attitude we have is, no, we're not believing in this religion with eyes closed. We believe in, we believe in this deen with eyes open. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ I call to Allah with eyes open. So Allah says, if verify that it's guidance from me. إِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا Then whoever follows that guidance, they get, they get two benefits here and in the Akhirah. And that's something beautiful about this ayah. We'll start with that. Is that the, the, the phrase, there will be no fear on them, or there is no fear on them and they won't be the ones to grieve. This phrase has benefits in dunya and has benefits in the akhirah. It has two kinds of benefits. Once in, in this worldly life and in the next life as well. So Allah is guaranteeing the Muslims will not be in a position of fear here and no grief here nor in the next life. When we have to, that needs a little bit of qualifying. So let's take it one bit at a time. You know in, in Arabic, in Quranic Arabic especially, every little word and every little detail counts. When Allah talked about fear, He talked about, first of all, He talked about fear first. And He talked about sadness and grief second. When He talked about this gift He's giving us, He mentioned fear first and sadness second. This also has benefits. Because that which is in more quantity is mentioned first. And that which is in lesser quantity is mentioned second. Why is fear more? Because fear is associated with the future. For all of us, what we are afraid of is things that haven't happened yet. If it's sickness or the consequences of that sickness or it's the loss of a job or it's what's going to happen with my children or what's going to happen with this marriage or whatever, whatever, whatever. Everything that you fear is things, are things that haven't occurred yet. Fear is associated with the future. However, sadness is not associated with the future. Sadness is associated with the past. Things that have already happened make you sad. 
Things that haven't hap happened yet scare you. <laughs> After they happen, then you get sad. I'll give you a student example. You know, before the test, the student is afraid. After the test, the student is sad. <laughs> right? After the result comes out. So there's this, the future, we, we, think, we think of fear in terms of the future and sadness in terms of the past. Now the thing is, when you remember something sad, you become sad. But when you don't remember it, you move on with life. But fear, however, is always there. In small amounts and in big amounts, it's a permanent part of life. Actually, fear is a healthy part of life. The fear is the reason you get up early in the morning and get ready for work, because you're afraid of getting fired. Fear is the reason that you, you, know, you dress the way you're supposed to dress, because you might not meet certain standards. Fear is the reason you're studying for the exam that's coming. So fear even works for us in this dunya. Fear is the reason you might eat healthy, or might take care of your health, you know? So fear is a, is a part of a believer's life and even a non-Muslim's life. But Allah Azza wa Jal didn't say there will be absolutely no fear on them. The Arabic for that would have been لا خوف عليهم That would mean there is absolutely no fear on them whatsoever. Allah said لا خوف عليهم Which means for the most part there won't be any fear. Allah did not remove the possibility of fear altogether. Of course, in this dunya, believers might suffer a situation or be in a situation where they are afflicted with fear. But by and large, they will not fear like other people fear. They will not be worried like other people are worried. The other thing that's very powerful here, that I alluded to, I'm not going to give you all the notes from, my, from that lecture because they get a, it gets a little heavy, but I'll give you some um, snippets from it. There's a difference between saying, in Arabic at least, there's a difference between saying, so, so and so fears, or there's a fear on him. So for example, this person fears is saying something else, and saying there's a fear on this person is saying something else. Now let me explain the difference to you subtly. When you say, for example, the child fears, that means the child has the feeling of fear inside of them. They're feeling afraid. When you say there's a fear on the child, it means that the child is in some kind of danger. Even if they're not feeling afraid. Now let me put it in terms of an example. In example uh, uh, think of a young child, a small child, playing with a snake. Right? And the child is not scared at all. The child thinks it's cute. It's playing with a snake. At that time, we say the child does not fear. The child does not fear. But there is a fear on the child. The fear on the child implies there's a danger on the child. In other words, now you tell me, which is worse? The child feeling afraid or the child actually having a fear on them? Which is a worse situation? Having a fear on them, because that's an actual danger afflicting them. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't say, لا يخافونا. He doesn't say they don't fear. He didn't say that. Actually, all over the Qur'an we find a quality of the believers is that they do fear. In this dunya and in the akhirah, on judgment day, believers are in fact afraid. For example, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us the attitude of believers in this dunya, إِنَّا نَخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْطَرِيرًا You know, we fear from our Lord a, sad, a master, a sad day, we're afraid of that day. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى Whoever was afraid of standing in front of their master, fearing, feeling the feeling of fear, you know, having that emotion is a good thing. It's a quality that Allah praises of the believer. You know, but on the other hand, and by the way, يَخَافُونَ يَهُمَنْ تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ They fear a day on which hearts will be turned and eyes will be turned. But on judgment day, Allah is describing, even though they will feel afraid, which is normal. I mean, the sun and the moon are colliding into each other. You know, the, ocean, the oceans are boiling over. Wild animals, وَإِذَا الْوَحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ Wild animals are herded together. It's normal to feel afraid. But on that day, Allah is giving us this, this consolation even if you're feeling afraid, know one thing. There isn't actually something to fear for you. There is no fear on them. You understand? In other words, even if they feel afraid, they're not in any danger. What a gift of Allah Azza wa in this ayah. Then he says, وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ And it is not they who are going to be grieving. Now the hum here is important. The first implication of hum is Allah is hinting, there will be others who will be grieving. Not the believers though. So he's alluding to those who don't follow this guidance. And there's a very powerful lesson inside this ayah. A lot of times people refuse to follow Allah's guidance because they think if they follow the guidance, they won't be happy. Like the laws of Allah, 
will make life difficult and harsh and we can't have any fun. You heard, heard these kinds of logic before? Right, if we follow Allah's guidance, we won't be happy. Allah says whoever follows it, they're not gonna be the ones who, who end up in sadness. In other words, people who try to pursue happiness in anything other than Allah's guidance, will end themselves up in empty sadness. How many Muslims, I could tell you, how many Muslims I personally know, know that used to be non-Muslim before. They were living the life of partying and clubbing and things that they thought were making them happy and all of them were, would say that you know when we finish the weekend of boozing off and partying and you know, hanging off, you know, uh, suffering from a hangover, at the end of it I felt like disgusted with myself. I felt like something was empty inside of me. I wasn't happy. And every week I would try to do this, thinking this is gonna make me happy, I would, even, I would only get sadder with my life. The only, the first time I felt peace in my life is when I came to Allah's deen. You know, how, how many of my friends are like that? That used to be this way when Allah guided them to this deen, then they found happiness. So Allah is giving us this clue. The second thing inside this ayah is it's a verb. In other words, when fear was mentioned, Allah used a noun, khawf. When sadness was mentioned, Allah used a verb. Now I know this is kind of technical, but I'll, I'll be very brief. Nouns are permanent linguistically, and verbs are temporary. So when Allah mentions fear, He alludes to it, He talks about it in permanent form. But when He talks about grief, He talks about it in temporary form. Which is amazing, because fear is permanent in human psyche. But grief comes and goes, it's temporary. So that the emotion that is temporary is mentioned in verbal form. And the emotion that is more permanent is mentioned in permanent form. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. Then finally about this ayah in regards to this dunya and the next. In this dunya there is no loss for the believer. They can't lose. You know, the believers were addressing the hypocrites and they said to them, I believe this is in Surah At-Tawbah, هَلْ تَرَبَّصُونَ بِنَا إِلَّا إِحْدَ الْحُسْنَيَينَ are you waiting or procrastinating in our case? And we're only gonna end up in one of two beautiful things. Husnayain, two beautiful things. One, we lose in battle, we die and we go to paradise, we still win. Or we win in this life and Allah gives us reward in the next life. In other words, the Muslim can't lose. It's only a win-win situation for the believer. So much so as something that everybody gets sad about. You know, when people get sick, you become very sad for them. And it is, it's a very difficult thing for families to cope with and things like that. But from an Iman point of view, from a faith point of view, when the Messenger is brought Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, someone who's sick, what does he say to them? La ba's, the first things he says, la ba's, no problem. That's the first thing he tells them. It's a strange thing to say to someone who's sick. Sick, he says la ba's, then he says tahoor insha'Allah. It is a purifier by Allah's will. In other words, the longer you are sick, all of your previous sins are being paid for. And when you end up in front of Allah on Judgment Day, and you, instead of complaining, Ya Allah, why did you keep me sick for so long? I was, you know, I had diabetes, I had cancer, I had, you know, I had really bad allergies, this and that. On the Day of Judgment, you will thank Allah for that sickness. Because each, each second of that sickness was getting rid of you, rid, rid from you, these sins. And you come before Allah purified, subhanAllah. So the person is going through affliction in this world, but even this is not sadness for them. Allah Azza wa even makes that a, a place of joy. You know, this, this is the power of this deen. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون And nobody, nobody outside of this deen can enjoy this kind of tranquility and peace. How are you going to find, what kind of people are these, that their homes have been washed away in Pakistan in these floods? And the, the fatawa are being passed in Peshawar and different you know, madaris in Pakistan, that they don't have to fast. And yet, and their homes are gone. They don't even have food to eat for iftar and they're still fasting. They're still fasting. What kind of people are these? You know, this can only happen when Allah gifts somebody with iman. May Allah, you know, make their affliction easy and make it a, an easy road to paradise for all of these people that, are, that Allah Azza wa is testing with this great trial. And on this note, I should mention, following Allah's guidance, one important thing. There are two very difficult trials in this dunya. Very difficult trials. They're very hard to pass. You know what those two trials are? One of those trials is extreme difficulty. Like a calamity, like a flood and an earthquake or you know, serious famine and poverty and hunger and you know, a violence and things like these are serious trials, very difficult. You can lose your faith in that kind of a trial. That's one kind of problem that, that, that can test your faith. Here's the second, extreme luxury. When everything is easy, you open the fridge and you have all kinds of drinks, all kinds of food in front of you. Right? All kinds of luxuries are before you. You know what happens when you have too much luxury? You start taking it for granted. And when you take it for granted, then you stop being grateful. So when one thing is missing from the menu, you start becoming angry. 
or one thing is less than what you suppose you were expecting then you get upset you know you can go to a three star hotel and then say man I should have been in a three and a half star you know you start thinking what more can I have you stop being grateful for what you have and this is a loss of faith also so some people in this dunya are right now being tested with difficulty and others don't think we're not being tested we may be tested with luxury we may, may, we may be tested with ease I mean Muslims in this country we live some of the most luxurious comfortable lives anywhere in the world some of the most you know lives of kings I know there, there are parts in the Muslim world where like children have meat on the table on Eid day <laughs> and they get one piece of meat and this is like on Eid I had you know what I had I had a leg of chicken and they, they're amazed by it and how much food we throw leftovers and things like that we're not grateful people so we're, there's a compare, what, what I'm trying to tell you is don't just think they're being tested with calamity, we're being tested as well. So now Allah says, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. Then He gives the, the warning. والذين كفروا وكذبوا بآياتنا. In other words, there are only two alternatives. On the one alternative is people who follow Allah's guidance. He didn't even say believe, He said follow Allah's guidance. What's the opposite of that? وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا And as for those who disbelieved and lied against our miraculous signs, أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارْ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Those are the people of fire in which they will remain. They will remain in it. May Allah not make us from these people. But I want you to understand the contrast here. The Qur'an is full of comparison and contrast. Usually the comparison and contrast is between Iman and Kufr. الَّذِينَ amanu, الَّذِينَ kafaru. Right? This is the contrast. But in these ayat, that's not the contrast. The contrast is between those who follow guidance, not believe, follow guidance, and those who disbelieve. In other words, this time Allah is teaching us a lesson. Don't just think you can claim that you believe and you don't follow guidance. No. Not good enough. Then you fall in the latter category. May Allah protect us from it. الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ اللهم لا تجعلنا فِي أَصْحَابِ النَّارِ Okay. Then Allah Azza wa Jal, speaking of people who do kufr, speaking of people who lie against the ayat of Allah, what are the next words? يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ <laughs> Immediately. You see the connection? Allah Azza wa Jal gave this warning to Adam alayhi salam. And then Allah mentions the nation because He said, whenever guidance comes to me, com comes to you from me. And to connect this, I, I should make mention of one more thing here. When Allah mentioned guidance coming, He said, فَمَن تَبِعَ Whoever follows my guidance, singular. Whoever follows my guidance. Not وَالَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ hidaya. Whoever, the people who follow my guidance. He mentions guide, following guidance as an individual thing. You know why? Because sometimes following guidance means you have to be alone. Following misguidance, everybody can do it. And they'll do it in a herd. And when you want to follow guidance, you have to stand away from the herd. It's like swimming upstream. You'll be the only one sometimes. You might be the only one in your family who's trying to stick to Allah's deen. Everybody else is going in the opposite direction. Look at the messengers. When they start their missions, alayhi musallatu wasalam, all by themselves. And the people who follow them, the, the loners in their families, the, every, the whole family you know, goes against them. So following this deen and following its guidance has to be a very personal, brave initiative. But then the gift of Allah, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون When you do follow Allah's guidance, He gives you a new company. He gives you company of believers. So the rest of the ayah is plural. In this dunya, you get the company of believers. And in the akhirah also, لَنُدْخِلَنَّهُمْ فِي الصَّالِحِينَ We will enter them into the company of the righteous. May Allah give us that company in dunya and in akhirah. Right? So now, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ O sons of Israel, Israelites, أُذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةِيَ الَّتِيَ الْعَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ Remind yourselves, make mention of my favor, the one I favored you with. أُذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةِيَ الَّتِيَ الْعَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ Now this word an'ama is very important because the previous surah in the Mus'haf is the Fatiha, all of you know it. Does the word come up in the, that surah too? It does. سِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ you know, an'amta alayhim. And th this is a very powerful ayah. The path of those who you favored. And now Allah says to Bani Israel, I did favor you. We're asking for the path of those who were favored. There were people before who got that favor but didn't appreciate that favor. We're being taught a very, very serious lesson. A lot of times when people read Bani Israel, you know, the accounts of Bani Israel, especially in Surah Al-Baqarah, they read it and go, oh man, those Jews, there was some crazy bunch. You know, how could they do this, that, and the other? And you're, you're thinking of how, what losers they were, and how dare they do this to Musa alayhi salam, and how could they respond to Allah in this way, and things like that. But actually, 
you were missing something. When the Sahaba heard these ayat, it wasn't so much that this was a case against Bani Israel. They thought of who first? They thought, they thought of themselves. Look at, for example, a conversation that happens between Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, uh, anhu was telling Muawiyah radiallahu anhu about the ayah الَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةِ Those who hoard gold, gold and silver. You know, he was warning him about Muslims being obsessed with saving too much wealth. So he quoted that part of the ayah. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu says, نَزَلَتْ فِي أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ يَا أَبَا ذَرْ This was revealed about the people of the book. This is not about us, this is about the Jews and the Christians. And what does Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu say? He says, نَزَلَتْ فِيهِمْ عِبْرَةً لَنَا It was revealed about them. But it's a warning and a lesson for us. In other words, even when they read about Bani Israel, they're not thinking about Bani Israel, they are thinking about themselves. And this will become abundantly clear in this surah. Abundantly clear that as we read their accounts, we are being told, look, there's a, there's a veteran nation that had guidance, that was given a book, and there was a, the messenger sent to them is the closest to Muhammad in many regards, Musa alayhi salam. You know, he was commanded with many a things that the Messenger of Allah was commanded with وسلم, And there's a reason he is the most mentioned Messenger in the Qur'an. Because his case study will help us do our life and, and live our life as an ummah better. We, we, we must care, carefully, carefully analyze all of the mistakes of Bani Israel. Why? So we don't make those mistakes. That's the point of it. So now Allah begins, Udhkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. So when you're listening, Allah telling Bani Israel, remember the favor I favored you with. Now you have to think. They should remember the favor they were favored with. But don't we have to remember the favor Allah favored us with? What is the favor Allah favored us with? He made us the last ummah. He made us the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He made us Ahlul Qur'an, the people of Qur'an. He made us the people qualified for the shafa'a of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is not a small favor. You make mention of the favor Allah gave you. And you know by the way, when you remember somebody's gift, you appreciate it more. If you don't remember the gift, you don't appreciate it. This, is, this has to become part of the culture of Muslims. We all know we're Muslims, we all know we're people of Qur'an. But we have to remind each other, can you appreciate that Allah gave us this book? It should be like a new gift every time. We should remember this book as a gift from Allah Azza wa We should remember our messenger as a gift, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as a gift given to us, a special gift from Allah Azza wa and he says, "Udkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum wa awfu bi ahdi ufi bi ahdikum." Now that you remember this favor, what should be the natural consequence? You fulfill, fulfill the, my promise, fulfill my promise, and I will fulfill my promise to you. And ufi is majzum, which means it's jawab al shart. If you fulfill my promise, then as a consequence, I will fulfill my promise to you. My promise to you. What is Allah's promise to them? You know, there are two promises to them. There's a promise in dunya, and there's a promise in the akhirah. The promise in, the, in this dunya is if they established Torah, they would have eaten from above them and from below them. This was the promise given to them. If you can follow this book, I will make your dunya into Jannah. I will give you everything. You know, people run after dunya, Allah, t Allah gave them the formula. If you just follow my guidance, you'll get dunya too. I'll give you that too. You won't even have to run after it. It'll just come to you. And then there was the reward of the akhirah. The same thing has been given to us. The, this promise has been given to us. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You know, and in that ayah, Allah mentions, لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا You know, he says he will establish the believers in the land and he will make them follow generation after generation and he will settle them after their situation of fear, he will remove the position of fear from the ummah. Is it not the case that the ummah is in a position of fear today? The, the vast majority of Muslims live a life of fear. And Allah is giving them the way out of that fear. It's, it's very, it's, it's such an oversimplistic thing. But you know, and if I, you and I give speeches about it, it's something else. If we all just heard Allah's speech, Allah telling us come back. It's a, di it's a different thing. This ummah has to be called back to Allah's khutbah, Allah's wa'ma'idha, Allah's advice which is Qur'an itself. You know, our, our, across this world, in this month, the ummah is listening to Allah's promise. Allah's words, every night. If we just reflected on one page of what we were reciting, just one page, this favor of Allah, it would be easy for us to fulfill the promise He has made with us, and then He would fulfill the promise He has made to us. وَإِيَّايَ farhabun, And be afraid only and only of me. 
Look at the beautiful sequence. First Allah said, mention my favors. He didn't say fear first. And this is very important for the da'i. Sometimes the da'i, the people who call others to Allah, they're too busy scaring people about Allah. They're scaring people about Allah. This, the fear of Allah, even Bani Israel, these are hardened criminals. So the first thing you would logically expect is, you, they should be scared first. But even Allah tells them, no, the softening of the heart will not happen from fear. The softening of the heart will happen when you mention Allah's favors on you, when you become grateful. And then becoming afraid of Allah will become easy. That's the road that leads to the fear of Allah. SubhanAllah. وَإِيَّايَ farhabun. And we're talking about really hard hearts. We're talking about the hearts of Bani Israel. That are, Allah mentions that stones aren't hard enough. أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَصْوَى Even they can be softened when the dhikr of Allah is mentioned. So he says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنَّ الْقُلُوبِ He says, وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَهُ I'll probably dedicate this session inshaAllah to this discussion because inshaAllah, because it is coming up later, I don't want to spend too much time on it then, but this is a common controversy. I spoke about it last year uh, uh, here as well. He says, وَآمِنُوا and believe. He's inviting who to believe? Bani Israel. This discussion is beginning and it's going to go on for many passages now. It's going to go on. And we have to remember where, where it began. When it begins in, this, in these words, the first invitation given to them officially is after being afraid of making mention, being afraid of Allah, wa aminu, and, and come to believe. Come to believe in what? Bima anzaltu musaddiqan lima ma'akum. Believe in what I have sent down as a confirmation of what you already have. It confirms the truth of what you already have. What is Allah talking about? When He says, believe in what I have sent down that confirms what you have. What they have is Tawrat. What confirms the truth of the Tawrat is the Qur'an. And accepting the Qur'an, the Qur'an at the time is not a book. I'm holding a book right now. That's not, the Qur'an at that time is not a printed book. What is it? It's words coming out of who? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In other words, when Allah says, believe in what I have sent down, it necessitates not just believing in the Qur'an, but what? Believing in the Messenger Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first Iman they are called to is Iman in Risala. It's not Iman in Allah, it's not Iman in the Akhirah, it's not good deeds. The first Iman, the first faith they are called to is faith in the Messenger. Why am I making such a big deal about this? Because later an ayah is coming. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَى وَالصَّابِئِينَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ The ayah is coming in the same discussion. Those who believe, those who were Jewish, those who were Christian, those who were Sabians, whoever believed in Allah and the last day and acted righteously has no fear. Three conditions, believing in Allah, the last day, and acting righteously. In that ayah, there is no mention of the book. There is no mention of believing in messengers. So people have made futile attempts to reinterpret that ayah to mean you don't have to believe in the messengers to be considered a believer. You could be from the Jews or the Christians or the Sabians or the Muslims and you have no fear. Wait a second. This is الَّذِينَ you know, جَعَلُوا الْقُرْآنَ عِظِينَ they took the Qur'an and tore it to pieces. They take one piece, they don't take the rest. It's part of a long discussion. In any studies, in any media, in any literature, there's a concept of taking something out of context, right? The context is the first iman they were called to is what? Iman in the messengers. So the only imaniyat left are Allah, the akhirah, and good deeds. So the leftovers are mentioned there, but the first thing is mentioned here. It's all part of one continuous discussion. But when you start looking at the Qur'an piecemeal, then you can make whatever conclusions you want. Are you believing in some parts of the book and denying other parts of the book? This has been used by some to undermine the legitimacy of the importance and the, and the, the, the central importance of belief in the Messenger And by the way, Bani Israel, they, they will tell you they believed in the Akhirah. They will tell you they believe in Allah too. How come Allah calls them kafirun then? How come Allah says, why, why are you the first to have be, وَلَا تَكُونَ أَوَلَا كَافِرٍ بِهِ Kufr, Kufr of what? What's left? They don't deny Allah. They don't deny most of the Prophets. They, they don't even deny Jibreel alayhi salam, even though they have problems with him. <laughs> They don't deny him. The only problem left is what? Believing in this messenger. You don't believe in him, the whole, nothing counts. 
You don't, in Iman there's no 95%, I believe in 95%, the other five I'm not too happy with. So I'm not gonna believe in that. Doesn't work that way with Iman. Even for a Muslim, we're, we don't have the option of saying, you know what, the Christians are giving us a really hard time. So I've decided not to believe in Isa alayhi salam anymore. We don't have those options. We believe in all the messengers, alayhi salatu wasalam. There are no short, there, there is nothing short of 100% when it comes to Imaniyat. Nothing short of 100%. So wa aminu bima anzaltu musaddiqan lima ma'akum. Believe in what I have sent down as a confirmation of what you have, what is with you already. In other words, Allah is alluding to the fact that they already know. They looked up in their books. Is there another messenger coming? Is there a final book coming? And they found proof in their own books. And then the messenger came and fulfilled all the signs. You already know he's confirming what you've got. You've got the confirmation, but you put it in confidential files. You don't share it with anybody else. But you know. You know. He says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَ كَافِرٍ بِهِ Don't you be the ones that are the first to disbelieve in it. How can you be the first to disbelieve in it? You come right out in your disbelief. You know Allah Azza wa Jal, this awwal doesn't mean uh, chronologically, because the first to disbelieve were the Quraysh. So what is awwal kafir? Don't be the first to disbelieve. Don't be in front of the line in the, being the worst of the disbelievers. Even the Quraysh, even though they were staunch enemies of Islam, they had some ounce of decency in them. And what they believed, they believed. You know? But these are, they've taken the front, front row seat. They've taken the priority seat in being the enemies of Islam. And this, the other reason this is mentioned is, the, 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 the Jews were people that knew about prophets. They had some concept of prophets. They had some concept of previous books. So it's more, you know, and the Quraysh had no concept of prophets since Ibrahim alayhi salam. And no sharia, no different prophets, nothing. So it's, it was, the Muslims were expecting, well these, are, these people have some experience with prophets and books, it'll be easy for them to accept this prophet because it's from their tradition. But the Quraysh, we can understand, they can't, they, they don't, they're jahil, they don't have any knowledge of these things, so it's a tougher case for them. But the irony that the Quraysh were easier actually than Bani Israel. Many, many of the Quraysh are of the Sahaba now. Very few from Bani Israel came to Islam. Very few from them who were in the, in the Arab lands came to Islam. So, وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَ كَافِرٍ بِهِ And then Allah tells them what, what they were hiding. And Allah exposes them. And this is part of the miracle of uh, the Qur'an. Allah exposes the secret agendas of the enemies of Islam. He says, وَلَا تَشْتَرُوا بِآيَاتِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا don't sell my ayat for a small price. Don't sell out. What does that mean, don't sell out? It means they knew already he's the messenger of Allah. But they, they had to keep that information from their own. Why? Because if they tell their people, they will accept. And if they will accept, a Gentile, a non-Arab, a, a non-Jew rather, a, a, not from the children of Israel, if they accept him as a messenger, then their special status is gone. Now this, he's got slaves following him, he's got Arabs, he's got Persians, he's got Romans, he's got Salman al-Farisi, Suhaib al-Rumi, you know, Bilal Habashi, he's got every nation under him. There's no special status for any nation. If we accept this, our special status is gone. We can't accept that. You know, and our monopoly over being people of, of the book, that's gone too. And Allah, you know, so don't sell out for a small price. And have taqwa, fear only and only of me. In this ayah, there's a serious warning to all nations that get a book, including ours. It will be possible that there will be people of knowledge who will take Allah's book and the, the laws of Allah, the sunnah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and interpret it in a way that fits a particular agenda. Because they are afraid of certain elements or people or backlash or whatever, they will interpret Allah's book so it's pleasing to the people. While not being afraid of Allah. Allah says, don't sell my ayat for a small price, a small gain that you will get from the people. And if you do that clearly, it proves that you have no fear of me. So he mentions, وَإِيَّايَ فَاتَّقُونَ Have taqwa only and only of me. In other words, right now you don't only have taqwa of me. Seems like you have fear and concern for protection from other sources too. You know? وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَكْتُمُوا الْحَقِّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ And don't disguise truth with falsehood. This is also something people of knowledge are capable of doing and Muslims are no exception. Even Muslims are no exception. You can quote ayat and a hadith and as evidences and you can make it sound like the falsehood is the truth. It's very easy to manipulate text. 
Remember Allah already told us, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا He will misguide with it many. So when people already have a preconceived agenda, a notion, they want to push a certain idea, they can actually use the Qur'an, they can use the Sunnah to actually come up with false conclusions. It is very possible. It is extremely possible. And so Allah Azza wa Jal warns Bani Israel, He says, don't dress the truth with falsehood. And you know how that's done? 90% of what you say is true and you mix in a little bit of falsehood in there, so it gets kind of disguised. And a, what's a little bit false is all false. It's all false. But you can disguise it really well. وَتَكْتُمُ الْحَقِّ While conveniently hiding, covering up the truth. In other words, this can be done, you know how? When somebody has a particular, and this is happening a lot in, our, in the ummah today. In my opinion, Allah knows best. And I know this might sound controversial to some of you, but I have to say what I believe. You know? In my opinion, there are two extremes in how the religion is being manipulated in our time. There's what you can call a liberal extreme, that are trying to interpret any, everything about this deen in a way that will make non-Muslims happy. They're not concerned about the fear of Allah, they're concerned about what non-Muslims will say about us. So anything that sounds politically incorrect, let's reinterpret it, or not even talk about it. Taktumul haq. Right? Don't, and they hide the tr truth conveniently. And they'll present themselves as professors and PhDs and doctors, etc, 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 and come up with these, you know, these watered down, clearly ingenuine interpretations of the religion and the book. On the other extreme is the angry extreme. There are people who are angry at the state of the ummah and the atrocities that are happening to the Muslims. And their anger is leading them to interpret Allah's book that justifies their and further you know, solidifies their anger. This book, you cannot come to it from grief. Grief leads to anger. And on the other hand, you can't come to it from fear. Fear should not be a motive in interpreting this book. Neither should grief. We have to come to it with fearing Allah only. You know the two negative emotions Allah mentioned in the surah, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. And in the extreme misinterpretations of our religion, you have people of khawf and you have people of huzn. And they're both interpreting the, the religion in what suits their personal agenda. And assuming that this is a genuine cause for the religion. This is not. We have to be level-headed when we come to this deen. We have to put our emotions aside. And we have to put fear of anybody else aside. And wallahi, it is my conviction. This is my personal conviction. You don't have to agree with it. My personal conviction is if the Qur'an was presented without compromise, genuinely, authentically, with proper study, there is nothing we have to be ashamed of. There is nothing that's politically incorrect. There is no controversy. This is a book of fitrah. This is a book of human decency and human nature. If we did our job presenting it right, Anybody would see the sense in it. Anybody. Except those who are bent upon hating us anyway. Well, no matter what we say from our mouths, they're going to hate us anyway. You know, nowadays they've got this new thing with, with taqiyya, right? Taqiyya is the concept of Muslims seeking for the purpose of protection, them lying. They, they developed this, they got it from some book and they say, oh, you Muslims, either you're all terrorists, and those of you that are not terrorists are using taqiyya. So when you speak against it, you're just lying to protect the terrorists, right? So the, the ones who, who want to paint us with a certain brush, they will paint us no matter what we do. No matter what we do. But we have to be genuine to Allah's book. And if we are genuine to Allah's book, Wallahi, this country will see a different Islam. They will see the Islam that supposed, they are supposed to see. And we haven't really, in my conviction at least, the Muslims, we have not done our job explaining this book for the fear of Allah alone. Even if we do explain this book, it's for the fear of the people. We have to explain this book for the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he says, وَلَا تَشْتَرُوا بِآيَاتِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا وَإِيَّايَ تَتَّقُونَ وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَكْتُمُوا الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ And you deep down, you are the ones who know that you're hiding the truth. It's not like you're convinced of your own interpretation either. You know you're doing this for your agenda. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ And you know this is a means to an end. The, the, he says, establish the prayer and give zakah. He commands the previous nation. Establish the prayer, give zakah. Why? Because when you truly establish prayer and you truly give zakah, zakah literally means purification. And so establishment of salah is establishment of the dhikr of Allah. If these two things are there, you're actively purifying yourself and actively remembering Allah, then you will develop the fear of Allah and not anyone else. Allah is giving them the cure for the disease they suffer right now. It is aqimu salah wa atu zakah. Warka'u ma'ar raki'een. And make ruku' among those who make ruku'. This is very interesting. Very interesting. You know Allah Azza wa Jal in one place in the Quran, tomorrow I'll show it to you. 
Allah Azza wa talks about the salah of the people of the book. But when he talks about it, he says they make, they make uh, sajda and they make ruku'ah. In other words, he changes the sequence. What's the normal sequence? Ruku'ah and then sajda. With the salah of the Muslims, you all know what comes first. Ruku'ah and then sajda. So warka'u wasjudu, right? But in regards to people of the book, Allah Azza wa in one place he mentions, they make sajda and they make ruku'ah. Hasidic, traditional Jews, very, very conservative Jews, they don't, let, they don't even use video cameras, they're that conservative. But on YouTube you'll find, I think there's one video of some some guy put a secret camera in their prayer services, and they, they recorded it. Their salah looks, looks almost exactly like ours, except there's one difference. They make sajda first, then they make ruku. First they make sajda, then they make ruku. SubhanAllah. And Allah mentioned when He talked about their salah, He mentions the, their sequence, Sajda first, ruku' second. Now, in this ayah, Allah told them, they make ruku' too. But this time Allah said, warka'u ma'ar This time you, you've been making ruku' but now it's time for you to make ruku' with those who are making ruku' in other words, who? The Muslims. This time you're supposed to join these people who are making ruku' Join them. Warka'u ma'ar Subhanallah. What a powerful ayah. You know, and he, he told them, establish salah. They said, fine. Atul zakah, yes. With them, up until now, this is, very, this is the last thing I'll share with you, in these, in these ayat, Allah has still not declared them a separate nation. And the Muslims a separate nation. Up until now, the Qibla is the same too. And the Muslims even fast in the same, on the same day. Ramadan has not yet been revealed. Allah is still giving them an opportunity to come on in. Look, you guys have messed up enough. I'm giving you an opportunity to remember the favor I gave you and get back on track. And why don't you join those who make ruku'ah? He didn't even call them believers or separate. He called them a raki'in. The believers are called a raki'in here. Why? Because the, 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 the Jews are almost given an invitation as though they are a deviated group within the ummah. They haven't been separated and kicked out yet. They're being given one last chance. Warka'u ma'ar raki'in. And finally, actually, I should at least uh, do this one last ayah, the scariest ayah in this passage. Atta'muruna nasa bil birri wa tansawna anfusakum. Do you tell people to do good? And you forget about yourselves? Look at this question Allah asked them. And let's ask this question to ourselves. Atta'muruna nasa bil birri wa tansawna anfusakum. We cry, we have, you know, we, we have outrages over people not giving us our civil liberties and our rights and justice and Muslims should stand up for this or that or the other. How just are we inside our homes? How fair are we to our, our wives? We haven't given them their mahar. How fair are we when it comes to distribution of uh, the, the inheritance? How many people swindle others? Doesn't matter how long your beard is. If you're gonna cheat people in business, you're gonna cheat people in business, you know? And, and, and then on the other hand, we want justice from everybody else. You tell people about justice and good, you are the ones who tell them? And you forget about yourselves? You know? Muslims today, subhan, it's the sad day for the ummah that the, the worst advertising against Islam is the character of the Muslim. That's the worst advertising against Islam. You know, there are people, if they want to learn about Islam, or if, if somebody honestly comes to me and says, Brother, I'm trying to start a business, and I met some brothers at the masjid, they want to be partners with me. You know the first thing I tell them, at least I haven't had much Texas experience yet, I'm from New York still in my head. You know the first thing I tell them, watch out bro. <laughs> Not with a Muslim, please. Save yourself. How many times, all over the country, if I, talk, if I give a khutbah about justice or fairness, some brother come, brother, there was a brother at the masjid, he used to give me salam, he was, he, you know, sometimes he even leads the prayer, he's very pious, knows a lot of Qur'an, he's a hafid, this and that, and we got into business and he cheated me, how could he do that? Although that's how he could do that. <laughs> you know, because we've separated two things, the appearance of piety and the character of piety. So some Muslims have decided they're going to be ethical but not religious. And others have decided they'll be religious and not ethical. <laughs> you know? But we have Allah, Allah doesn't allow us to separate those two things. They go hand in hand together, subhanAllah. But we've separated those things. And it doesn't, and you know, some Muslims use this as an excuse. Yeah, I don't have a beard or I don't wear hijab because those people are all fake. No, that's a cop out too. That's not genuine either. You know, what Allah teaches us to do, He teaches us to do. But the misbehavior of Muslims, that they tell others to do good, but they forget about themselves. And the scariest one of this is people like me. People who recite Qur'an or teach Qur'an because there's nothing more good than Qur'an. 
So if we teach people the Qur'an and we forget about ourselves, nobody is in bigger trouble than us. The Imams, the Ulama, the Dua, the Khatib, the people who lead Salah, they are in the biggest trouble. So you guys have to make Dua for our sincerity. You know, because it is a serious matter. أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ And you in fact are the ones who read the book. You're the ones who are reading the book. You forget about yourselves. أَفَلَا تَعْقِنُونَ why is it that you don't understand? Allah will ask this question a couple of times in this surah. Then don't you understand? Afala ta'qilun? And these last words of this ayah that we're concluding with, I'll tell you something about aql that's beautiful in Arabic. You know the word aql in Arabic literally means to tie? Aqalat al mar'atu sha'raha. The woman tied her hair. Iqal, you know the old Arabs, they used to have a rope around their head. Nowadays they have that cute little rubber thing that they put on top of their scarf, so it doesn't fly away. But that's not what the iqal originally was. The iqal was a rope. And the reason they have a rope is because the camel does not come with anti-lock brakes. So when they park their camel, they have to take this thing off and tie up the camel. This is iqal, a means of tying it up. Now aql, the same root origin aql is used. Why? Because to the Arab, the word aql, intellect, means you have control and restraint. You have control over your emotions, that means you have aql. If you have no control over your emotions, it doesn't matter if you have a PhD, you're ghayr aql. You're not, a, you're not a someone who possesses intellect. For them, intellect is not about knowledge. You know what intellect is about? Self-control. Self-control. So there are two faculties inside of us. There's the heart, the center of our emotions, and there's the mind. Aql is a combination really of both. Where the mind processes things, but doesn't let the biases of the heart, whether it be anger or greed or fear or anything else, it doesn't let them get in the way. It keeps the emotions in check and then makes the right decision. Allah says, "Afala ta'akilun," implying, "Don't you understand?" On the one, uh, then don't you understand? On the one hand, they read the book; they're researchers. Allah just said, "Antum tatlun al kitab." You're the ones who read the book, so they do understand. So the problem isn't here. Where's the problem? It's over here. And that will become clear later on in this surah. Because the matters of the heart will come up over and over and over again. Afala ta'qilun? Because the hearts are hard. Why is it then? What, what then what keeps you from understanding? May Allah make us people of understanding. And may Allah Azza wa Jal keep us from falling into the pitfall.